Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Why Did the English Civil War Happen? by Kings and Generals. This appears to be sort of an introductory video and a new series Kings and Generals is doing on the English Civil War. I'm excited to get into this one. Once again, it is a topic that is sort of tangentially related to my expertise. I know a lot more about the 18th century. Obviously, uh, this is the 1600s, so it is a bit before what I know the most about in terms of history. Um, but I know a bit about it, and I find it very interesting. It's a fascinating conflict, um, so I'm really excited to learn more about it. If you guys end up enjoying this reaction, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's get into this video. Parliamentary democracy is one of the most dominant governmental systems in our world today, present in countries from Germany to Israel and India to Australia. Mm. Its origins, however, lie in the deadliest conflict in Britain's long and rich history. This is very true. The British system has been an influence for different countries throughout the world. Um, I feel like the American system and the British system are kind of uh, the two governmental systems that at least over the past 100 or 200 years, uh, new countries and new governments have been adopting. Um, of course, you know, the Americans took uh, a lot from the British system of the time, so there's a lot of intertwining there, but regardless, uh, they're right. It's a very influential way of doing things, um, and, you know, it was birthed from violence, like uh, a lot of different uh, governmental systems were, you know, Czech France, Czech America. Um, though, of course, this happened uh, quite a bit earlier, about a century earlier than, say, the French and American revolutions, and was definitely of a different character, you could say. Lasting almost a decade after its beginning in 1642, the English Civil War claimed hundreds of thousands of lives, unseated a royal house, and resulted in the development of a constitutional monarchy, which remains to this very day. Yeah, and it's pretty fascinating, because if you look at British history following this event, you know, it's a pretty well-known thing that, though there were countless revolutions throughout the world and in Europe in the following centuries, Britain stayed rather stable. They reformed and they evolved over time. Um, but they did not experience um, political unrest to the same extent that places like France or Italy or Germany did. They managed to avoid a lot of these serious major uprisings and revolutions because the British system was able to slowly reform itself over time. And of course, that was all birthed out of this episode of massive violence. Um, so that's sort of an interesting trend to look at. Before we cover the battles of the period, however, we'll be outlining the many reasons behind the outbreak of one of the most politically impactful conflicts of all time. Mm. It's not all about division, though. This video... All right, so you guys know the deal. Uh, shout out to Kings and Generals for making fantastic videos. Um, if you guys want to show them some support, which you absolutely should, please go and check out their video, which is linked in the description. Uh, go check out their sponsor, leave them a like, subscribe to their channel, you know, show them some support for their... Uh, detailed and entertaining work. 100 diamonds right away. Go create some legendary heirs in this one-of-a-kind RPG. The Stuart dynasty came to power in England when the childless Elizabeth I died on March 24, 1603, and was succeeded by King of Scotland, James VI, who then also became James I of England. Mm -hmm. This reign united the realms of England, Scotland, and Ireland under one monarch for the first time, and saw an increase in the popularity of divine right, the God-given authority of a monarch to rule as he wished, unhindered by his nobles or people. Yeah, and this was not something unique to Britain. Um, this ideology was really spreading throughout Europe, particularly in the early 1600s, this idea of divine right or uh, this system of absolute monarchy, this idea that the monarch was sort of chosen by God. He was God's representative on earth, and therefore he should have the absolute power to rule as he wished. You know, no one should be able to get in his way, whether it be parliament, nobles, the people. You know, he should have absolute power. 
Uh, Louis the Fourteenth of France is perhaps the best representative of this. You know, he was sort of the the main figure of this absolutist movement, um, but it was happening all throughout Europe. Uh, of course, most prominently and most relevantly to this series uh, in Britain. After 22 years on the throne, during which momentous events such as the sailing of the Mayflower and Guy Fawkes' gunpowder plot took place, mm. King James died in March 1625 and was succeeded by his second son, who ascended to the throne as Charles I. A scholarly-oriented man with a penchant for hunting, it immediately became clear that Charles had inherited his father's enthusiasm for divine right and began acting in ways which profoundly angered influential factions in his country, the most yeah. important of which being Parliament. Yeah, and the difference, um, you know, I mentioned Louis XIV being the main representative of this movement. The difference is that Louis was successful. He was able to really reduce the power of his nobility and rule in whatever way he wanted to rule. But in Britain, as we're going to see, uh, the monarchs ran into the issue of Parliament, um, you know, which was a fairly powerful institution and an institution which often directly opposed the monarch. Um, and so, you know, this is why they would come to clash. Today, the British Houses of Lords and Commons are the governing institutions of the United Kingdom. But in the mid-17th century, this was not yet the case. The king still had executive decision-making authority, and his decree was the only means by which Parliament could legally convene. However, by the mid-1600s, the Houses had gained significant de facto power, such as the ability to raise taxes far mm -hmm. more effectively and smoothly than the king himself, making it hard for English monarchs to operate without parliamentary approval. Upon ascending to the throne in 1625, the outwardly Protestant Charles married Henrietta Maria, the staunchly Catholic sister of France's King Louis XIII. Yeah, and, um, you know, if you know anything about England at this time, uh, they are not particularly fond of Catholics, so they do not want, especially their monarch, to have anything to do with Catholicism um, at all. While this was at first viewed as a shrewd diplomatic move, Maria's fervently pro-Catholic actions made the predominantly reformed English despise her. Mm. This religious dimension of the royal parliamentary divide was made worse by a number of factors both internal and external. In mainland Europe, the Thirty Years' War was raging without end. Many in England, and particularly in Parliament, wished to take up arms in order to prevent the Catholic Counter-Reformation from snuffing out their Protestant brothers. And for those that don't know, the Thirty Years' War was basically this massive Catholic v. Protestant conflict. Um, it was really of an insane scale. There was so much death and destruction. Uh, it occurred primarily in uh, the region that you know we would look at modern-day Germany, and the region was completely devastated. Um, though I will say, you know, it was a Catholic versus Protestant conflict, and that's how it was framed. But um, in many ways, it was also, you know, it had geopolitical motivations. So there were Catholic powers on the Protestant side, and vice versa. You know, it wasn't that simple. It was not just a pure religious conflict. There were a lot of geopolitical elements at play. Um, but that was sort of what it was shrouded in, was this religious conflict, and it was incredibly destructive. But Charles would not do so in a direct fashion. The meager attempts in 1625 and 1628 of Charles to intervene at Cadiz and the Siege of La Rochelle, respectively, were blundered and only increased tension between the king and his parliament. Even worse than this was the increasing influence of William Lord, the intrusive Bishop of London, who advocated an anti-Calvinist sect of Protestantism known mm. as Arminianism. This denomination rolled some Christian practices back closer to those of the Roman Catholic Church. And, and you know, I feel like it's worth noting at this point that it's not like the Church of England has been separated from the Catholic Church for too long at this point. I mean, it, it really hasn't been that uh, lengthy an amount of time. Uh, and in addition, Anglicanism, uh, some would see it as sort of in between Catholicism and a lot of mainstream Protestantism. It maintains a lot of the ceremony that the Catholic Church has. 
Uh, and over time, it would move back and forth more similar to one or the other. Uh, and so it, it would be relatively flexible. But of course, moves towards, back towards Catholicism would be very unpopular with many people in England at this time. It was viewed as yet another sign that Charles I was dangerously friendly to the hated Papists. All of yeah. these factors gradually ratcheted up the tension between Parliament and the monarchy. In short, it was making England a powder keg. More mm. tangible issues were also at the heart of the Gulf, the most prominent of which was a growing opposition of the propertied classes in Parliament to the absolute rule of their monarch. Yep. The first Parliament called by the King in 1625 got off to a bad start on this front, because of that most enduring of issues, taxes. You of course, and taxes is uh, almost always what it really comes down to, and this is where monarchs and their nobles would often get into big disagreements um, because taxes were the most important thing. I mean, if you think about the functions of government at this point, you know, they have, governments did way less at this point than they do in our modern era, and one of the main things government did was tax the people, um, and so this was one of the main disagreements. I mean, if you think about, for example, the French Revolution, uh, the main reason Louis XVI called the Estates General, um, which is perhaps the closest thing France had to some sort of government or parliament, aside from the monarch itself, it was because the country was flat broke, uh, and he needed permission to levy new taxes. And so we're getting the same thing here. The nobles, um, who are making up the parliament, uh, you know, they're going to disagree with the king over, you know, the most important thing always, taxes, tax policy. Um, I mean, just to throw another in, if you look at the American Revolution, what was one of the main causes of that? Taxes. You know, you, you, you peel all of these political issues uh, away, and what do, you, what do you get? What's behind everything? Taxes. Usually, Parliament would grant a new monarch permission to levy customs duties called tonnage and poundage for an entire reign. Mm. But for Charles, they only gave such permission for one year. Parliament did grant levels of funding and taxation that would have been adequate in the past, but that was woefully inadequate when taking into account inflation and other costs. With Parliament continuously unwilling to grant sufficient funding, Charles began to raise money by his own means. Mm -hmm. Money was borrowed with the crown jewels as security for repayment. Tonnage and poundage customs were collected regardless of parliamentary approval, and, most annoying to those affected, so-called forced loans were imposed on Charles's wealthier subjects. Overall, Charles raised over £250,000. Yeah, there was basically a bunch of odd ways that Charles uh, had to use to raise revenue because Parliament wouldn't give him sort of the traditional levers uh, of taxation. Um, and I, I don't know the specifics, but I, I just know that there were a bunch of weird things that he tried pursuing to raise more revenue um, so that he could govern effectively. But these measures caused anger and resentment. Many gentlemen refused to pay and were imprisoned, mm. while others hindered the actions of local collectors and were similarly jailed by royal decree without trial. Because this method of imprisonment was normally only used when the state was in exceptional danger, Charles's use of it was viewed as abuse. When Parliament was summoned again in 1628, a representative named Sir Edward Coke authored the Petition of Right, a document which set out a list of specific liberties which Charles would be absolutely forbidden from infringing. And, you know, well, there already has been the development of some English idea of liberties and rights. I mean, you know, one of the biggest documents uh, in that regard was the Magna Carta, which uh, happened long before this, but sort of in this era, we can really see the development of some of these modern ideas that um, would really characterize modern Britain and modern America, for that matter. These ideas of liberties and personal rights and, and that kind of stuff. Now, uh, a lot of these things, as we can see here, and with the Magna Carta, were developed um, as sort of a method to protect the nobles against the king, but later on, they would be spread to everybody. Um, this idea of liberty you know, was initially a, a rather constricted one that would be spread as time went on. Uh, so it's sort of interesting. We can see a lot of the ideological uh, origins of these ideas that would come to be so important uh, the next century.
uh, and the century after that, uh, and to the modern day, really. Amongst other things, primary concerns were the illegality of arbitrary imprisonment and tax collection without parliamentary consent. In desperate need of parliamentary approval for funding, the king eventually accepted this document, but it is widely believed that he simply believed he was just reaffirming age-old liberties and was not conceding anything new. One of the main proponents of the petition was a staunch opponent of the king called John Pym, who would mm. later become a parliamentary leader. Yes, John Pym will be uh, a very important figure throughout the whole English Civil War. Um, he will crop up many times uh, in this series that Kings and Generals is doing. Tensions escalated further when in 1629, a dispute about continuing royal customs collection was viewed by Parliament as an illegal contradiction of the Petition of Right. When the exasperated King ordered Parliament to adjourn, members held the Speaker, John Finch, in his chair so that the session could not <laughs> formally end. He was held there long enough for resolutions against Charles's religious reforms and his collection of royal duties to be read out, a slight which was too much for the king. I mean, we're basically seeing Charles trying to impose absolute rule, uh, and it's failing. Um, now, Louis XIV, you know, he was successful in imposing absolute rule. Now, he also faced some pushback from his nobles, um, but he was able to effectively navigate that uh, and really take control of them and, and rule over them. Though I think Charles is definitely faced with a stronger institutional uh, opposition. Um, you know, he has this institution of parliament, which is filled with the most powerful nobles of the land, and there are, a lot of them are really not interested in going along with what he's trying to do, which I can imagine from his perspective, from Charles's perspective, is very frustrating. You know, he's thinking, you know, I'm the king. Uh, I've been chosen by God. If I want to tax you, you should goddamn let me tax you. In fact, I don't need you to let me tax you. It's my right. Uh, and Parliament says, no, you know, we have the, the liberty to decide, um, you know, what uh, you are and are not going to do with regard to taxes. So it's a pretty frustrating stalemate for Charles. So on March 10th, 1629, Charles I dissolved Parliament and arrested some of the ringleaders who had been behind the unrest, inadvertently making them martyrs and providing a rallying cry for those who opposed the absolute rule. Mm. With the would-be cash cow parliament disbanded, the king made peace with his foreign enemies and embarked on a period of sole rule. To his supporters, it was the personal rule, but to his enemies, it was the more sinister sounding 11 years tyranny. Hmm. There is a general assumption that this decade-long period must have been very evil by its nature. While many occurrences within these twilight years of peace directly led to the strife of the 1640s and 50s, it was not nearly as horrific as it's often portrayed. In England, personal rule began quite positively. While hardcore Puritans, radical Protestants who were convinced that the Reformation was only half done, thought that so-called High Church Arminianism was the devil's work, the common man was not as opposed. Yeah, keep in mind, if you're a common person at this time, you probably, at this moment, don't have a dog in the fight. It probably doesn't matter that much to you whether Parliament or the King is in charge. I mean, you're not represented by either of them. Um, if you're a common person, Parliament absolutely doesn't represent you at this point. They represent mainly the nobility. Uh, and the king doesn't represent you either. So, you know, you probably wouldn't mind if either one was superior to the other. Um, you're also probably not as radical on things like religion um, as, say, the Puritans, who were a very radical group, and many of them, you know, would flee to the colonies, to North America, in order to set up their own radical religious communities to do things exactly how they wanted to do. But most people in England at this point were not at that level of radicalism. Um, they were not that extreme. So I think they're making a good point that, you know, sometimes uh, we may unfairly characterize this period of one of, like, horrific evil and tyranny. Um, and perhaps if you're coming from the perspective of a high noble or a parliamentarian, you might think that. 
but coming from the perspective of a regular person, you know, probably it's not that different than normal life. Many ordinary people responded quite positively to the more formal approach to religion and readily embraced William Lord's moderate reforms at the beginning of the 1630s. Mm. Even Henrietta Maria became more docile, and it's clear that the personal rule was a happy time for the royal family in a personal sense. The Queen even gave birth to a child named Charles in May of 1630, a child who three decades later would be King of England in his own right. Mm -hmm. Younger Charles's birth was supposedly celebrated with great enthusiasm across all three kingdoms that the Stuart dynasty held sovereignty over, with Well, look at that, all is well. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> bonfires lit in the baby's honour. It must have been a happy time, which the royals were soon to look back on with sorrow. Later, as a widow in her native France, Maria described her feelings during the 1630s golden years, stating that I was the happiest and most fortunate of queens, for not only had I every pleasure the heart could desire, I had a husband who adored me. Hmm. In continental Europe, the situation calmed somewhat during the personal rule, with the death of Gustavus Adolphus at Lutzen mm. in 1632. Despite the Swedish king's reputation as a hero of Protestantism, the stalemate which ensued in the aftermath of his passing began to decrease the level of religious fear and paranoia felt in English society. Catholic dominance of the Thirty Years' War during the 1620s had conjured a spectre of yet another invasion of the British Isles. With the stalemate, the threat deteriorated significantly, if it was ever possible at all. Mm. Meanwhile, Charles proved himself a champion of theatre, painting, architecture, music, and other aspects of high culture. Wow. Over yeah, and, you know, a, a lot of the uh, cultural patronage um, would have to wait until the 1700s, where a lot of countries really ramped up their patronage of scientific societies, um, you know, literary groups, etc., etc., a lot of this stuff. Um, but, you know, some of those trends really began with the absolute monarchs of the 1600s. You know, they wanted to create institutions which, you know, had their name on them, um, sometimes literary, often not literally, um, but like their stamp, you know, these scientific institutions, um, institutions of theater, of the arts, whatever, um, that, you know, they had created, they had sponsored, they had some control over, uh, obviously, you know, this is sort of like early or perhaps a little before the scientific revolution, we're getting into that, it's far before the enlightenment, so a lot of this stuff has a while before it will flourish, but we do see some of the beginnings of that, um, and it's sponsored from the top. Overall, a Capuchin priest named Father Cyprien reported back to his superiors in France that England is an abundant country and has no taxes. The inhabitants lead a luxurious life, far removed from the poverty of other places. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that that's a very rosy view, the inhabitants. Well, you know, most of the inhabitants would have been very poor, uh, a lot of farmers. So, you know, or most of the inhabitants would not have led a luxurious life, um, but maybe in contrast to other places. <laughs> As we will see, however, all was not well in England. Mm. Despite the Queen's increasing contentment, her zealous Catholicism was set to be an insurmountable problem for Charles. However much he tried, suspicious Protestant doubters would forever believe that Maria was attempting to use her position to slide England back into the grip of Rome. Yeah, like I said, you know, the people, particularly the more radical amongst them, did not want the monarch to have anything to do with Catholicism, even if they were not Catholic themselves, if their spouse or whatever was Catholic, the people did not like that. I mean, even today, um, the monarch of Britain could not be Catholic. Um, that would not at all be allowed because the monarch has to rule over the Church of England. So if we ever get to a point where <laughs> the next monarch of the UK um, becomes a Catholic, we're going to have a big issue on our hands, but I doubt that's going to happen anyway. The Queen's many Catholic attendants who had accompanied her to England also proved themselves an issue, though not in Charles's own opinion. The King actually seemed to find the Catholic courtiers quite charming, 
and found himself able to relax in their company. Hmm. It is crucial to note in Charles's defence that he does not seem to have been going Catholic in any way, but had polarised interests which made it seem like he was. Yeah. Specifically, he was tolerant of Catholics and an enemy to the extreme Puritans whom he and his new Archbishop of Canterbury saw as a threat. You know, I think it's funny sometimes um, when people are talking about early American history, they say something like the Puritans escaped uh, to, you know, America, to North America for religious toleration. They wanted toleration. Not true at all. The Puritans hated religious toleration. They were extremely intolerant of other people. The Puritans escaped to North America because they wanted to have their own extreme intolerant communities where everybody was Puritan and, you know, they all followed the same rules and the same religion. Um, and we see that because if you look at the early colonies, um, you know, some of the other colonies were founded because uh, some dissidents would break away from this extreme Puritan society. So, no, the Puritans did not uh, leave England for religious toleration. Uh, they left because they were far more extreme than everybody around them, and they couldn't accept that, uh, you know, <laughs> they couldn't accept, frankly, other groups of religious people. Um, th that's why. Uh, of course, there, there was an element of, uh, you know, the Puritans would be mistreated at certain points in the future, and no one really liked them following uh, the rule of, let's say, Cromwell and, and all of that stuff. So, yeah, the Puritans did get treated badly at a certain point, but, you know, the Puritans were one of the most intolerant religious groups out there. So I always sort of find it funny when we talk about, you know, early Puritan settlers in the Americas and the idea of toleration, because they were not tolerant in the slightest. Upon ascending to that position in 1633, Lord began to overreach his authority and make everything worse for almost everyone who didn't share his own <laughs> view on church matters. Damn. In addition to his pope light innovations to the Church of England, which convinced many Puritans that they were gradually being delivered to the Catholic Church on a silver platter, mm. Lord also repeatedly prosecuted Puritans and opponents of episcopacy, the government of a church by bishops. One trial in 1637 became notorious for its brutality, involving three men named John Bastwick, William Prynne, and Henry Burton. They were pilloried for their defiance against Lord and had their ears cut off. Prynne had already suffered this punishment in 1634, and so his face was branded to bear the letters SL, or Seditious Libeler. Jesus, and this is some of the brutal medieval torture that continued far later than I think most people realize. I mean, we see it going on here. A lot of this horrific torture would continue um, fairly far into the 1700s. <laughs> A lot of this horrific medieval stuff. Um, so, yeah. This awful torture didn't have the effect Lord wanted, and even moderate Protestants viewed the trio as martyrs. To them, it was becoming clear what was happening. Vile Catholics were being allowed to practice out in the open, while good, pious Protestants were persecuted. William Lord would soon after cause the spark which eventually set England ablaze. Uh -oh. As the Venetian ambassador said of him, this pest may be the one which will ultimately disturb the kingdom. Despite the largely peaceful and tranquil nature of Charles's early personal rule, the need for money was not diminished in the slightest. Unwilling to call another parliament to grant him subsidies, a number of creative measures were used to raise royal funds and at the same time bypass Westminster. Mm. Predictably, these clever legal tricks were viewed by parliament as blatant petty cash grabs. The first of these measures was the selling of monopolies over a product or industry to one individual or company, exploiting a loophole in the law that forbade this. Despite raising over £30,000 per year for the king, this policy... And to be fair, at this point, you may think that sounds like a very odd thing to do to raise money. Um, but at this point, if we look at sort of the global economy, this is often how trading functioned. You know, each country would give a monopoly to trade a certain product or trade in a certain region to uh, a company or a group of traders or something. 
Um, you know, we have not reached free market open trading or free market capitalism at this point. Um, we still very much have a lot of closed systems where monopolies often uh, rule, monopolies empowered uh, by different countries' governments. Plus, he angered almost everyone else. Merchants excluded by the monopoly were annoyed because they couldn't trade, and regular labourers were annoyed because under monopolies, prices tended to rise in return for inferior products. Mm. Most infamous was the soap monopoly. Dubbed Popish Soap, this product supposedly blistered the hands of those <laughs> using it, and because of the Catholic manufacturing board of the monopolist company, was said to blister the soul of Protestants as well. Yeah, I mean, first, sounds like a bad product, but two, you can just see how religion is tied up in everything here. Um, religion is still extremely important at this point. Now, you know, going into the 18th century and then following that, we will start to see the decline of the importance of religion. And perhaps, at this point, it already is less important than it once was, but all of this is just tied up in the dislike of Catholics and anything related to Catholics or the church or papists or anything. And of course, you know, William Lord and his administration sort of uh, acting unfairly towards Protestants or imposing these new reforms, you know, people are just getting very upset and anything that's related to that is not going to be well liked. Uh, and of course, this is all tied up in, you know, Charles's reign. So people are getting very unhappy as well. Charles also began reintroducing obsolete medieval laws in strange ways, reviving ancient fines on knights, people living in royal forests, and people building homes outside of designated areas in London. These fines were originally designed to coerce the fined individual into stopping a certain action, moving mm. out of the forest, for example. But Charles did not want the individual to cease the action because he wanted to keep fining them and bringing in the money. <laughs> Yeah, and this is what I was saying about how Charles used a bunch of very interesting and odd methods to raise money. And you can see why this would really frustrate a lot of people, because, you know, even if it's technically on the books and Charles can make a legalistic argument for it, if you're someone who's just living uh, outside some arbitrary boundary, and you've been living there for a while maybe, and now you're getting these random fines, you'd probably be extremely frustrated, and fairly so. Um, but to Charles, of course, he's just trying to raise more money, uh, and he's probably feeling like, you know, he only has to do this because Parliament won't let him raise taxes in the traditional way. While this was a technically legal and clever use of the letter of the law, it went against the spirit of the law and was widely viewed as unjust. Yeah. The king's most infamous fundraising measure was called ship money, which was reintroduced in its original form in 1634. It essentially served as an emergency financial levy in case of invasion, which allowed the king to collect money if there was no time to call parliament. Maritime counties would contribute funds for the construction of ships, hmm. which would then theoretically be used in defense of those counties. Very sneaky. Um, not to mention that, uh, you know, as I'm sure we've all noticed, uh, Ireland and, uh, you know, uh, Britain, these are islands, the British Isles, and so uh, a lot of these islands are maritime counties. You go up and down the coast, you're covering a lot of the countries, uh, and so a lot of the money. It was a fair system if employed as it was intended, but of course Charles I found a way to make it despised. Supported by the meddlesome Archbishop Lord, hmm. Charles extended the collection of ship money to inland areas as well. Areas Ooh. which were traditionally exempt due to their land. <laughs> Never mind. I was just saying how, you know, since we're talking about islands here, uh, covering maritime counties would be enough. But Charles disagreed with me. He felt that <laughs> he had to uh, extend this tax to everybody. Back of a coast. Moreover, the collection of ship money was an emergency levying of funds, and there was no true emergency. Mm. However, the king got around this by having his lawyers bring up an old statute dictating that it was the king who determined what was or was not an emergency. So the king got his money at first. When the ship money tithe was repeated year after year though, it became a massive problem to parliament. Yeah, and we can really see how this is becoming an issue. Charles is using 
all of these odd little tricks, these old medieval laws that no one's touched in a couple hundred years. He's, you know, interpreting or misinterpreting these laws in very strange ways. Um, and not only is he doing it once, he's doing it year over year over year because Parliament won't let him tax. And so, you know, even if the people would be okay with you doing this emergency ship tax once, um, which the people are still annoyed by it, if you're doing it every year just to fund your government, people are going to start to get really frustrated. And of course, everybody's thinking, like, this can't go on. Like, you know, we need a regular system of taxation. And I'm, I'm sure Charles feels this to a certain extent as well. He doesn't want to do this, but he also doesn't want to work with Parliament. But eventually, you know, something's going to have to change. After all, annual monetary tithes are in reality taxes, and taxes could only legally be raised with parliamentary consent, yep. however much the king tried to legally state that it was not a tax. Naturally, all of this generated intense resistance from such individuals as John Hampton, whose mm. actions in 1637 challenging ship money gave him a reputation as a champion of individual liberty. It also connected the parliamentary cause with property rights. In this episode, we've outlined the beginning of Charles I's reign all the way to the late 1630s and the last days of his increasingly controversial personal rule. Hmm. In our next video, the twin fuses of religion and taxation will come together and cause an outbreak of violence in Stuart's Scottish motherland. This will eventually lead to the outbreak of war in 1642 and the first decisive battle at Edgehill. The Cavaliers and Roundheads will soon come to blows, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. Alright, that was a good video. Um, I'm excited to get into the rest of the series. That was a good intro to uh, the conflict, or the sort of the build-up to the conflict. Um, you know, as they said, this all sort of emerged from the issues of religion and taxation. Um, the most controversial <laughs> topics of all time, perhaps. Um, and topics that are going to get people really riled up. Uh, and as we're going to see, they do get people really riled up. Um, a massive civil war results from these issues. Uh, so yeah, I'll be excited to get into the rest of the series. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this reaction. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.